All right, so we can get started now. Good morning, I'm Jessica Fleet from the South Central Regional Library Council. I'd like to welcome you to the very first webinar in a series that we're calling Keeping Up with the Collections, which will showcase digital collections in New York Heritage. Today's webinar is about digitizing women's suffrage materials from Cayuga County through a partnership that was between Wells College and the Howland Stone Store Museum. And I would like to welcome our presenters. We have Tiffany Raymond. She's the acting director of the Lewis Jefferson Long Library at Wells College and Marilyn Post, who serves on the board of the Howland Stone Store Museum. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, so um, I'm just gonna get started real quick and then I'll hand it over to Marilyn to talk a little bit about the collection itself. Um, so I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to our two institutions. So I'm from Wells College, which is a small liberal arts college in Aurora, New York. Um, our library at the time of this project consisted of two full-time librarians, one part-time librarian, and two full-time paraprofessionals. Um, and we also had several student interns who were working in the archives at the time of our project. And then uh, Howland Stone Store Museum and their new building, Open Door, which is gorgeous. If you're ever in Sherwood, you need to go check out Open Door. Um, they're located in Sherwood, New York, and uh, the museum focuses on the, the Sherwood Equal Rights Historical District and the work of the Howland family and other local residents. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, oh, actually, sorry, I forgot I put the slide in there. Um, so our partnership. So uh, we are two institutions that are very close to each other uh, locational wise. Um, so we had previously digitized a collection of materials that were donated to Open Door about two or three years ago that were focusing on women's history. Um, we had done this through a previous digitization grant through SCRLC. It's called the Elsie Gutchess Great Women of the USA Collection. It's available on New York Heritage if you want to check it out. There's also some great suffrage material in there. Um, but then the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment uh, kind of gave us the perfect opportunity to highlight some of the Stone Store Museum and Open Doors collection of suffrage materials, which you're going to be seeing in just a moment. Uh, so Marilyn, I will turn it over to you to talk about suffrage and the collection. Um, I'm controlling the PowerPoint, so just let me know when you want me to move to a, uh, the next slide, okay? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh a little bit about the collection to begin with. Uh, it exists because the Howland family, specifically Isabel Howland, whose, whose picture was in the middle of those two posters a few slides ago, uh, and her mother and her father established a library, a reading room uh, in Sherwood when, they, when her father built a new store building in about 1890, or 18, in the 1880s, excuse me. Uh, so it opened in 1883. And as a library and reading room, it was a place where women could gather uh, and it provided the impetus for eventually forming the Sherwood uh, Equal Rights Association, uh, eventually the Cuga County uh, Political Equality Club. There's a picture behind me eventually. Uh, and uh, it also, over the years, served as a reading room and a, a, a sharing library where people could take out materials and a place where there were a lot of women's materials, women's magazines, women journal, uh, the uh, voter magazines, and even things from, from uh, primarily the National Association for Women's Suffrage. Um, over the years, because the Howlands essentially had were, uh, the, the women did not marry, Isabel did not marry and her aunt uh, Emily did not marry. Uh, they did not have children and their personal house collections were sold off at auction. Um, we mentioned the open door building and that was actually Isabel's home it was her parents' home before that. She enlarged it in 1910 and wanted it to be a very welcoming place where people could come. She had rallies here on the grounds, which were beautiful gardens, partially done by her mother. They were all very interested in uh, botany and plants. 
and uh, gorgeous gardens. So they had 4th of July suffrage rallies here and all kinds of different events. So, and we're having a grand opening in August. August 20th and 21st, or 21st and 22nd, one or the other. Anyway, because Emily Howland and Isabel Howland and Hannah were all very much involved in suffrage, Isabel served as secretary, among other things, for the state association and for the local association um, in Cuga County. So, she was in charge of things. And after suffrage passed and the Cuga County Political Equality Club closed down its Auburn operation, she was able to roll up posters and uh, they got stashed in the library. And the library functioned as a library until um, the early 60s. And then for a while it was under the control of the Cuga Museum, and then eventually uh, local people wanted to get it open again and uh, took it over from the Cuga Museum in uh, about 1990, the late 80s. Uh, and it's an all, all volunteer museum, but we keep finding things, even things like Susan B. Anthony's birthday cake turn up. So, um, and it's, it's very interesting looking at the different things in the collections. Today, we'll look at a few pamphlets and some of the posters. Uh, because as you see more and more things, you see how well organized the suffrage movement was over all those really the, the last 30 years of the movement and, and just how important local organizations were to uh, getting suffrage passed. And, year after year after year, they worked and just struggled to get more and more people interested. And then you learn a little more about them. And they also like to have a little fun here and there with their, their uh, birthday parties and singing suffrage songs and things like that. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll go to the first slide, I think, the next slide. So one of the emphases, which emphases, which we don't always think about with suffrage is that working women were important. Um, we kind of think of most of the suffrage people being, you know, at least reasonably well off, but much, they really were concerned about working women. Um, and uh, most of us would, it's, it's hard to think about what money was worth in 1900 or 1910, but clearly $7 a week won't get you very far. Um, and we don't always realize just how many people were working at that time. And some of the posters actually list all the jobs that women had and how many were working where. Uh, so that's one of the things uh, we, we want to look at. When we see the posters with the blue and gold, they're, they're primarily ones that were published by uh, New York State and the New York State uh, Association for, for Women's Suffrage. Uh, we'll go to the next, because I'll talk too much if we're not careful. Pamphlets were a big deal. Uh, and there are pamphlets about everything including how to organize your club and what questions you should ask and all sorts of things. But these are, are two of a series. And the one about fire prevention on the right actually centers on um, factories that have been built in high rise buildings uh, and are just fire traps. Um, we, we hear about the shirtwaist fire, but there was also a Philadelphia Tower fire, which is mentioned in here. And they're trying, they figure if women could vote, they would have better fire escapes and wouldn't be locked in. And all of the things that you hear about with the, the horrendous of fires that still occur sometimes in, in um, other countries and all the flammable materials. Um, the other one about the war system is, 
quite modern in its its outlook. It 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 talks about all the if all the money that was put into battleships and other things were put into things that were useful for society, even uh, training programs for people, it would we'd we'd have a much better society in general. So that just um, many many of these these topics that come up in the pamphlets are actually very topical today. Okay, let's go to the next. Um, as the women's uh, movement got a little bit closer into the, into the teens and the 20s, you see the images of how women are portrayed change. We're, we're no longer seeing the matronly women uh, who have been around for years and years. You clearly are moving into another generation of suffrage women. Um, much more slim, a little Art Nouveau. Uh, and, and this, you know, gets younger women interested. And we also have kind of a, in the victory one, you're, you're starting to see a little more of the patriotic thing, although they always use lots of flags. Um, the gold lady on the right, um, that poster, was it, it represents in part just the role that women artists could play in producing posters. This was done by Evelyn Ramsey Carey, Rumsey Carey uh, from Buffalo. She did um, the poster, the Spirit of Niagara poster for the, um, uh, the exposition in Buffalo in the early 1900s. And it's, it's kind of similar in um, to one of the British posters too, but it's it's obviously very much very much a victory sign too, and also draws on, on parables. So you've got a little bit of everything there, and she's we're getting the fruit of her work, uh, and it's also on my shirt. Yes. So anyway, we'll go to the next. As although war was generally something that women and the suffrage women were pretty strongly against when the country was moving towards world war one they were they saw an opportunity to use uh war and war propaganda um as a way to kind of make the vote owed to them in a way because they were working so hard so um we, here we have outlined many of the things that uh, women have done in the war. And obviously we have the graphic over here with, we give our work, our men, our lives if needed. So it's very much, we're, we're doing so much. We're doing these jobs. Uh, we need the vote. Okay. Go to the next. Um, this one is actually a really huge poster because the bottom of it is entirely blank and you can fill in your local information um, on the bottom. So you could write in who was coming and uh, get the advertising out there. There was one year when the Cuba County Political Equality Club uh, put out about almost 50,000 posters. Uh, not all of them huge and big, many of them small and doing, doing uh, everything from advertising uh, bake sales to uh, fairly important speakers. But this was, was a way where they could advertise and have things set up and ready to go and get it out uh, immediately. And you can see how, how, patri how we're working with the patriotic theme here. Uh, to get more support and just getting the idea of the acceptability of suffrage uh, was hugely important. It took a lot longer when you didn't have social media to do that. Okay, go on. Uh, this one is one of a series by Lou Rogers, who was uh, a woman artist who did lots of cartooning and her work appeared in many of the magazines, 
but she also took some time off and went throughout New York State with her easel and talked on street corners and drew at the same time. So this one says, take up that burden. And it's the work of field factory shop and home. And it's uh, the poor woman down here is carrying her baby. And this militaristic guy is, is ordering her about. And she's just got to take care of everything. Uh, they're really quite fun. And, and Lou Rogers is credited with being kind of the inspiration for Wonder Woman in, in terms of her drawings. So she's, she's, she's a fun person to learn a little bit about. And, and women, even today, there are not that many women who are cartoonists. And it's, it's another example of how suffrage really was good for women artists. Okay. Um, this is a local, uh, just a little, a little open air meeting, women's suffrage. State and Clark Street is where the women's are the political equality club was located or near there. Uh, and people came from all over. Here we have a man speaking. Uh, and people, the people who came to speak were generally quite well known. Uh, I did not look him up. I looked up one of the other ones just because I couldn't remember. Uh, but they 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 grew drew quite large crowds and they really um, helped make for an, you know, an exciting event. So, okay, we'll go on. This is a hand painted sign. And I do, I, I like the hand painted signs. They're, they're uh, very fun and very fresh. And this is actually quite large. Uh, it's, it's probably, at, it's, it's probably 24 by 30 or something like that. It's, it's pretty big. Uh, and it's, which side of the fence are you on? Are you anti or are you for? And there is quite a bit of anti uh, information in our, our collection. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see how they, re they use the anti propaganda to encountered it uh, in some of the publications. Okay. So this is the anti-suffrage monologue. I actually read at uh, a tea party event not too long ago. Um, we have a neighbor who owns one of the former Howland residences who uh, has a suffrage tea party every year. And we've done little plays for it. And, and this one is uh, really fun to read because she she it's very tongue in cheek and um a little absurdist but highly amusing it's 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 definitely in the satire area um and there are we have some plays and other things uh, a lot of people in the arts um were very supportive of suffrage uh one of the events that we have coming up in august is going to be at the Morgan Opera House. And there is a, a, a play that's being presented there, uh, which should be fun. Uh, the other uh, poster here, a few facts. This is, is one of the easel. Um, we have several posters that have are mounted so they could be on an easel and you could flip them and go through and tell your story and, uh, give your arguments in a very um, logical way. And it was easy for people who maybe were not comfortable speaking to have all their, their facts in front of them and they could, could go through them and, and teach a few people, a few men, just who should make the laws. Uh, and I, I really kind of, kind of like those, even though they're not very decorative, so. Lots of arguments. Okay, we'll go on. Okay, so this just represents some of the, the, the ways people had fun. The, they used many traditional songs uh, and made new words to them, whether it was the Battle Hymn of the Republic or uh, 
all, all kinds of things. This one is marching to victory. Uh, and you could, if you're a, a good songstress, you can do it. They also had celebrations for birthday parties. Uh, this one for Susan B. Anthony and Dr. Anna Howard Shaw uh, in 1914. And on other occasions, they celebrated uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's The Centennial. And they, they did make events out of these things. And they, they tried to keep um, the words of the early suffrage advocates right in, in the forefront as time went by on and, and to make it kind of a, a, a celebration thing. And the Hotel Biltmore is a nice place to have a celebration. So we'll go on. Okay. So why the housekeeper needs the vote. And the housekeeper needs the vote. So she, it can be a very safe and a very safe house. Among the things that are mentioned in here is having things like artificial coloring noted in foods and uh, having uh, good walls and uh, tenements that, apartments that are not uh, dangerous, things of that nature, uh, good lighting, all that sort of thing. And housekeepers need to be able to, to work on the very basics of life and uh, Jane Adams, of course, was uh, very well known, the Hull House Jane Adams, who was interested in giving advantages to, to lots of people, to, to lots of women particularly. Uh, and she, she supported women strongly. And her, she even had, she, she was on the cover of Good Housekeeping at one point, which the early magazine and telling people just how they should do them, but that a wide variety of people participated in suffrage. Okay. It's all yours. No, it's me. So I'm gonna talk a bit about how we actually went about digitizing this collection. Um, so what Marilyn showed you is a very, very tiny portion of both their collection and what we digitized. Um, we ended up digitizing somewhere around, I think 500 pages of material or, or something like that. There, there was a lot. Um, so first, what I want to talk about is how we chose what materials we were going to digitize. Um, if you've ever been to the Howland Stone Store Museum, you know that they have a lot of really great stuff and we only have so much time to work on this project. Um, so when we were looking at the materials we were going to digitize, we had to be careful with what we were choosing to spend our time on. Um, so when we started this, I received a list of some boxes that the Howland Stone Store Museum had with a summary of their contents. Um, and I went through them and chose about uh, 10 boxes that I thought contained the material that best fit with our project. Um, so the first thing that we looked at when we went through each box was the research value of the material. Would this material be helpful for researchers or um, would it be just good material to have out there? Uh, we also looked at the condition of the materials. Anything that was too delicate or in, uh, too rough a shape, we did not digitize so that we would not harm the material. Um, you can see on one of the pamphlets had some silverfish damage, it had the little holes in it. Um, and there, we did find quite a few materials that were, that were too delicate that we just didn't think that we would be able to digitize without destroying. Um, and we also wanted to focus on original items. So we tried to remove anything that was duplicated and we also didn't want to digitize anything that we thought was widely available um, in other sources. Uh, so in terms of process, we did have student workers assessing these items, which they thought was great fun. They, they really enjoyed going through the items and kind of seeing what all of them were. Um, that was supervised by me, the project lead. Um, and then once they had chosen the items that they thought would be good candidates for digitization, um, I went through and either approved or uh, disagreed with their choices. And then we moved on to digitization. Um, and just real quick, the image that's on this slide is a copy of Emily Howland's, or not a copy, it's the actual image of Emily Howland's uh, ticket to the Freeman, 
Freedmen's Village um, during the Civil War. So that was one of the items we digitized. So how did we actually digitize these materials? So we were working with lots of different types of materials. We had pamphlets, we had flyers, we had images, we had posters. I um, mean, they all require different software or different equipment to digitize. So the, the first thing that we used was our Zoichil Zeta Comfort with a Perfect Book 3.0. We use this for text-based materials. Uh, this scanner was purchased using a grant from SCRLC uh, several years ago um, when one of, our, one of our earlier digitization projects. And we purchased it because it is such a great tool for digitization. And we knew that we would want to be able to digitize not just our holdings here at Wells College, but we also wanted to be able to serve as a, a digitization hub for the local area. And we wanted to be able to digitize materials from smaller institutions like the Howland Stone Store Museum um, so that they could be made available to researchers out all over the world. Um, so the Zoichel Zeta, it is a overhead scanner. You can see it is there on the slide. Um, it does have a book cradle so that uh, the bed of the scanner moves to be able to accommodate more delicate material. Um, the Perfect Book 3.0 program that is on the Zeta allows for us to scan uh, books and it removes and corrects the curvature of the pages. So if the if you were to use an overhead scanner to take a image of a, a page in a book, you would often have this kind of curvature of the text because of the way that the page folds. And the Perfect Book 3.0 is designed to, to help eliminate that curvature so that the, the image looks flat and is easier to read. Uh, we did use this for text-based materials because those could be scanned at a lower resolution. We scan those at 300 dpi. Um, however, for images and image-based materials, uh, the Zoichel Zeta doesn't work because it can only scan up to 300 dpi and we needed to have a higher resolution. So we did use a flatbed scanner for our images. Um, the flatbed scanner is a lot slower. We can scan a lot more material a lot faster with the Zeta. Um, but we did what we had to do to use the, the flatbed for our images. And then for our posters, we did a combination of a digital camera with a tripod and a flatbed scanner, depending on uh, the size of the poster and its condition. And we actually, uh, Claire from SCRLC was the one who took the images of the posters. Um, and we did those on site. We brought that material to the Stone Store Museum or to Open Door so that we could scan the posters on site. Everything else that we did was scanned here at Wells. In terms of software, we did use Adobe Photoshop for image cropping and stitching. Um, the one thing that Zeta is not great at is uh, cropping images. It will often either overcrop and cut off the edges of images or it will just not crop at all. Um, so we did have to use Photoshop to, to crop the images and rotate them sometimes. And Claire did use Photoshop to stitch together the images of the posters because as you can probably guess, uh, if you use a flatbed scanner to scan posters, you can only get a little bit of a time. So we did have to stitch those images together. In terms of staffing, so we did have three library staff who worked on the project um, part-time. So that was uh, both of the full-time librarians, myself and the other full-time librarian, and one paraprofessional. Um, what we primarily did was uh, metadata and transcription. So for every item that we scanned, we did metadata for. So that is, if you're looking at the images on New York Heritage, that is all the information that comes below the image. So the creator, a description of the item, when it was made, what uh, who holds it, all of that information now. So for every item, we had to have a corresponding bit of metadata. I um, mean, we have found over the years that our student workers weren't terribly good at doing metadata. Um, for whatever reason, library staff seem to be able to categorize and describe things better than our students. So for this project, we decided to have the majority of our metadata done by librarians. The metadata that we did have some students do, I did have some student interns that I had do metadata on a couple items just so that they would be able to get that experience. Um, I did review it rather, rather carefully after they were done uh, to make sure that the metadata was complete and correct. 
We also had to do transcription. So any item that is handwritten um, has to be transcribed so that people who can't read cursive or if the images are not particularly great, will be able to read what's on the, the page when they're looking at it on their browser. Um, so anything that was handwritten had to be transcribed and that also had to be done by library staff because uh, one thing that you'll find if you work with college students is that they can't read cursive anymore. Um, so we had to do that and that that can be rather time intensive. Um, I'll talk about a couple of my favorite items that we did on the project in a couple slides and two of them required very heavy transcription. Um, so in terms of our students, what we had our students doing, we did have um, two students who worked on the project with us. One was a paid intern, he was paid under the grant, and another was a student worker who works in the archives as part of his work study. Um, they did the majority of the scanning of the items using the equipment in the archives, and they also did some minor photoshopping, primarily just cropping the images before they were sent to me for metadata and transcription. Um, so they did work part time on the project. Um, we actually had one of the students come up and help us with the taking images of the photos, um, but that obvious or taking images of the posters, but they, they did have to stop that once the college closed due to the pandemic. So once the college closed due to the pandemic, the student workers were no longer able to work on the project. Um, and the rest of that work then transferred over to the library staff who were still here or who were able to work on it um, from home or to go up to Open Door to scan posters with Marilyn and Claire. <laughs> All right, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was some of our favorite materials from the collection. Um, Marilyn and I are both gonna talk about some of our favorite things that we digitized um, that you can then go find on New York Heritage and then we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, so for me, I had kind of four things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the first, and that is the first image that you see on the side, this is a page from the logbook for the Cuga County Political Equality Club. So this was the Political Equality Club that was located up in Auburn. Um, the logbook is from 1914 to 1917, um, and it is basically a sign-in book for everybody who visited the Political Equality Club, whether it was for a meeting or to pick up literature or even to uh, inspect it for fire safety. There's fire inspector signatures in there, which is kind of cool. Um, but it was it was really cool to kind of see who was visiting this club, and if you're a local, you could look up the names of your ancestors and see if they supported women's suffrage. Did they go to this equality club? Did they go to any of their meetings? And to then see the names repeated and also to see the out of towners, like who were the big wigs in the suffrage movement who visited Little Auburn, New York, um, which is surprisingly a lot of them um, came through Auburn, New York and then signed into this log book and they would leave little notes like victory to you or good luck with your movement. Um, and so that that was really fun for me, especially because after I finished transcribing this, I actually went and took a walk in uh, the big cemetery, Fort Hill Cemetery up in Auburn and kind of got to see the names of these people that I've been typing out for weeks um, and then kind of see like how they fit into the greater story of Auburn. So that that was really fun for me. And if you have any descent or ancestors who ever lived in Cuga County, I highly recommend that you peruse through this log book on New York Heritage when it's there and see if any of your ancestors ever visited the Cayuga County Political Equality Club. Um, the second item that I wanted to talk about that was my favorite was the minute books from the Sherwood Political Equality Club. Um, so this book covers their meetings from I think 1903 to 1911. Some of it is typed, some of it is handwritten. Um, but these were essentially the minutes taken by the secretary at all of their meetings describing what they did. Um, and it was interesting to kind of see what their meetings looked like. So what songs they sang that day, what pamphlets people were reading, who was attending the national meetings or who was attending the local meetings, um, as well as how everyday life kind of played into both what they were talking about and how they met. So you would see things like, oh, we couldn't meet this month because there was a big snowstorm and everybody got trapped at home. Or oh, it was so-and-so's birthday, so we, we sang happy birthday to them. And one of the items that we looked at earlier that Marilyn talked about was the, the tea and celebration of, I think it was Susan B. Anthony's birthday. And you can see in the minutes that every year for her birthday, they would celebrate her birthday even after she had passed away. And they would tell stories about her life. And those that had met her would tell stories about, you know, what she said when they talked to them. And so kind of keeping the, those who had come before them in the movement 
even after they had passed away was was really cool so that's a really awesome item um if you're lo interested in local history or in the suffrage movement that's a great item to take a look at to kind of see what the suffrage movement looked like on a small scale in little sherwood new york um during this time period uh, you, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about posters. They're absolutely awesome. I think there's 40 to 50 or so posters that we digitized. I don't have the number on hand right now, um, but we have a lot of posters that we digitized that are now available on New York Heritage. The Woman in Gold is my favorite um, just because it's so beautiful. And if you can see it in person, the, the gold foil on this poster is it's just gorgeous to look at. Um, but there were also a lot of really just clever posters. Um, another one of my favorites is one that uh, it's called Convicts and Lunatics. It portrays that, like a woman in academic regalia in a jail with convicts and lunatics basically saying like, you know, why doesn't she have the vote? Um, and I thought that one was really clever. And so there's just a lot of really clever posters in there and just really beautiful posters to look at. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of my favorite parts of the collection were actually the anti-suffrage materials. There's a lot of anti-suffrage materials that we digitized um, that you can kind of see what the arguments for were against suffrage. We're 100 years out now, and suffrage is kind of something that we, we live with and we've come to expect. And it's interesting to see what the arguments were against women's suffrage and against women's rights and to see how they relate to how we talk about women's rights today. Um, as well as how the suffrage movement kind of used the anti-suffrage arguments against them. There's actually a letter where Emily, I think it was, uh, no, I think it was Isabel Howland wrote to the New York anti-suffrage uh, party and was like, hey, can you send me your materials? Like, I'm interested. And so they sent her a bunch of her pamphlets and whatnot that she then went through and used against them. Um, so that was kind of fun. I, I enjoyed transcribing that letter as well. Um, so Marilyn, what are your favorite things from the collection? Marilyn, you're muted. Mute. Okay, okay, okay. There you go. Um, I, there are, a, the, the posters fall into several categories. Um, we have five or six English posters, which it's just very interesting how the same posters turned up in all over the world, in Australia, Tasmania, England, Canada, all the English speaking places. And um, there are some things that are in other languages too, but it was an international movement. And, you know, we know Emily Howland went to uh, England for an international conference in the uh, near the turn of the century uh, and, and actually met Queen Victoria. Who, who wasn't the best suffragist in the world. Uh, but this, what's sauce for the gander is sauce for the goose is one of the English posters. And again, it is done by a woman artist, uh, Mary Sargent Florence. And interestingly, even now, I mean, she, she, was, she had a brother who was a sculptor, but early on she was the elder and she got the, or, sort of got her brother interested in art, but his name is a little bit more known than hers because of course she was a woman. Uh, and this is, this is just a fun example. And I like the international aspect. Um, I didn't show one of the maps, which, uh, or one of the posters that say, okay, people can vote here, here, and here, why can't we vote? You know, and there was a, a lot of that comparing places that had already, even the Western states that got this vote earlier, uh, it, was, it was really interesting. Anyway, the second one here is actually a hand-painted uh, poster done probably locally. Um, and it depicts the Liberty Bell and it has the crack in it of course, but we, uh, there was a Liberty Bell that was forged without a crack in Troy, New York and traveled across all the counties in Pennsylvania in 1915. And 
because Pennsylvania and it, its clapper was tied, so it couldn't ring, but it went everywhere when they were trying to get people to vote for suffrage. And it stayed silent until the 19th Amendment was actually ratified in 20 or in 1920. And then they rang it in uh, Philadelphia for every state 48 times. And it still res it resides now at the Gettys in Gettysburg at the Washington um, Memorial Chapel. So it, it, it does still exist. But I, I like both the fact that this is using the Liberty Bell. I like the story and I like the fact that it's hand painted. Uh, and even, even the banners and things that the women made, they really used whatever skill they happened to have, whether it was a writing skill to write pamphlets, to train people, or whether it was art or just whatever skill they had, they did use to try to get suffrage passed. So, and I find as I look at more and more parts of the collection, we keep, we keep finding things. And it's, it's uh, I was reading a, a letter that was written by Carrie Chapman Catt uh, on the eve of the 1917 election that passed suff suffrage in New York that basically said, whatever happens, we have to keep going and we have to keep going until we get all the states to, to ratify uh, the amendment. So it's just the whole attitude of, of working on this structure, this political structure that would maintain the effort over time, I, would, I find really pretty fascinating. Okay, I won't talk anymore right now. We'll, we'll, we'll answer questions. Do we have questions? Great, thank you so much. Thank you both for digitizing these materials and for and for sharing them with everyone. So we do have time for questions. If you prefer to ask your question, we're a small group today, so you can raise your hand and ask it, or you can type it into the chat. Um, Julia sharing women received the vote in New York State on the election date of November 6, 1917. So I believe the poster is significant in that date as well. Interesting. So I'll give people a moment to type in any questions if there are some, but I'll also let you know, we'll share out um, these slides with Tiffany's permission, as well as this recording. And I see that Claire shared a lot of interesting collections and resources in the chat. So I can kind of compile those as well and send them out. 